Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for the 18th of September 2013. Welcome along to another AV Forums weekly podcast. I'm Phil Hayton, editor of AV Forums, and joining me for this edition are games editor Mark Botwright. I must have fruit. Audio reviewer Ed Selly. Beautiful tree that was. Og designed it. 600 feet high, bright red and smelled terrible. And assistant editor Steve Weathers. I thought you said you were international criminals. So we start this week with some very sad news. And I think we, we need to take a few minutes here just to talk about Ray Dolby who sadly passed away last Friday. We were recording this on Monday at the age of 80. So for people that are not aware of uh, Ray Dolby, well, the surname should give it away, Dolby Laboratories. He set that up in 1965 in London and uh, went on from there to create all sorts of technology which um, has affected the way that we look uh, at film and listen to film and listen to audio. His first, uh, his first big product ed uh, was in the 70s with audio cassettes yes uh, noise reduction it all seems terribly quaint now but um effectively when when the original dolby noise reduction came out uh it made it, it really was instrumental in pushing cassette forward from being one of those compact and convenient but fairly sonically hopeless formats all the way through to to something which you know treated with a degree of mechanical respect could could do some genuinely surprising sonic things and um often it it sort of people tend to forget just how long and 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 sophisticated the process actually became i mean from fairly ordinary beginnings i mean by the time you ended up with the last the last tape based system which i think was double b s um, I mean, the, the the level of sophistication involved and the, and the performance that resulted um, was an order of magnitude different to uh, to what had been seen previously. And um, you know, I can remember a you know, I remember reading reviews as a kid, plowing through looking for a suitable tape deck, and you know, uh, they lived or died in review terms on often on just how well they they'd implemented their their Dolby software. And you know, all of that stems back to Ray Dolby, and it, it really was. He is an instrumental reason as to why the cassette, you know, actually featured for such a long period and, and, and you know, is still quite fondly regarded by many people. Of course, uh, the name is, is you know, synonymous with film soundtracks, Steve, but he didn't invent surround sound. Uh, obviously, you know, we can go all the way back to the 1950s with uh, six track magnetic. You can go back further than that, though, you can go back to the 1940s because Fantasound, Disney developed Fantasound for Fantasia, which was actually a surround sound system. Yeah. So, so, so he bit. didn't develop it, but his big idea was uh, a stereo soundtrack uh, with uh, using matrix technology to take out of the stereo track uh, the rear channels, uh, which not only worked fantastically well. Um, it was also cost effective and cinemas could fit this system uh, into their, using their old projectors, into their old uh, cinemas, put surround speakers up and um, it was cost effective and it, it went out pretty easily from there. Yeah, that was a genius of it really because they basically used the two, the twin optical stereo soundtracks which were already on the film uh, and by matrixing the um, centre and rear channels they could uh, basically make it backwards compatible and as you said cost effective to install. And the reason they could do that was because of the noise reduction uh, technology they developed uh, previously to that to, uh, with, with, t- with tapes. So it was kind of a, a sort of a follow-on technology from their initial um, developments. Um, but it was actually an incredibly clever uh, and, and, as you said, cost-effective and, and rather simple approach to developing surround sound for the mass market. Prior to that, it was only things like six-channel, 70-millimeter prints that had surround sound. Um, and, and obviously the mid-70s with, uh, actually not Star Wars, Star Wars wasn't the first, it was actually a Star Wars born the year before, but certainly with Star Wars itself, you know, that really you know, exploded surround sound in the cinema and, um, and nothing's been the same since. Not only surround sound, which he's uh, really well known for, that's a two big products, noise reduction on cassettes, surround sound for the cinema, but he also helped develop videotape, Steve. Yeah, I didn't actually know this until I was reading, uh, you know, his obituary last week. And, you know, you'd think, you know, most people would be happy with developing noise reduction for tapes. 
but no, not Ray. <laughs> he had to develop surround sound or mass market surround sound for the cinema. And if that wasn't enough, he was also a co-developer of videotape. So, you know, we can honestly say that Ray Dol I, I can honestly say, my hand on my heart, that Ray Dolby has had a fundamental effect on my life. He changed it forever. He's given me, you know, surround sound at the movies, take decks when I was a kid, videotape when I was a kid, home cinema at home. So, you know, Dolby Surround, Dolby Pro Logic, Dolby Digital. You know, I can honestly say this man has had a, a massive, massive impact on my life personally. And I'm sure, you know, being this is AV Forums, a lot of our listeners as well. He wasn't one for sitting back either um, and looking through his career and looking at all the different developments. So he, he introduced uh, Dolby Stereo, which was the, the matrix system. Um, he then went on to pioneer uh, another recording and playback system called Spectral Recording. Um, and I, I even remember the old trailers that used to run in the cinema before the film for for Spectral. It was a, a camera shot that went across uh, some meadows and then uh, the music built and then it went over the side of a cliff and you were almost in like a Grand Canyon area. Um, but sadly, Spectral Recording didn't last that long because they had to move quickly with uh, digital sound because that was late 80s. Then early 90s, they, they developed uh, Dolby Digital, which basically put the digital soundtrack in between the, the sprocket holes uh, on the on the film. Um, and it's it's kind of moved on from there, Steve. Uh, the latest incarnation of, of Dolby is Dolby Atmos, and you've had the pleasure of listening to this because it's, it's only in a couple of cinemas um, in the UK. Um, so all the way from there to where we are now, um, it's been a it's been a tale of progression, and not somebody who's sat back, and definitely not somebody who's uh, basked in the uh, the limelight either. He's he's he was a very private man and kept himself to himself, and didn't really bask in the glory of of his uh, of his inventions. No, he didn't. And from what I've read, he also you know was very keen to uh, you know encourage other people's ideas to to you know, sort of, you know nurture um, creativity within the company and, and you know and push technology forward as much as possible. But as you say, he was never one to take the limelight, despite being the namesake and founder of what is now a multi-billion-dollar company, uh, Dolby. I'm, I'm lucky enough to live 15 minutes from their main office in the UK, which is why I got a chance to initially listen to Atmos, which I have to say was amazing. And I have also seen a film. Uh, the Hobbit in Leicester Square, which is the Empire Leicester Square, which is the only uh, cinema I think at the moment commercial cinema with. You, um, you mean with was the only cinema? What else? What else has got Amos? Uh, well, Empire Screen One doesn't exist anymore, isn't it? No, I mean, have you not been following the news? <laughs> they have <laughs> turned it into two screens. Have they? Yep. When did they do that? Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Huh. So. Empire Screen One no longer exists. Oh, that's a shame. That was like the one decent big size screen left. Yep, yep. They kept it really quiet. Um, there was a website broke the news, and then they were going to confirm what they've actually done. But basically, what they've done is created two screens out of one. Uh, uh, and, so is it not? They, they, are they and both? One, one is an IMAX screen. So mm -hmm. there you go. But yes, that was up until they knocked it down or <laughs> knocked it into two. <laughs> that was the one cinema that had. Dolby Atmos in the UK, and I'm not sure if they're putting it into the new screens or not. Um, what but, Dolby are doing is they're trying to push now to be a one-stop shop for digital cinema. Um, so they've taken the move away from just pure sound, which obviously was their background, and now they're delivering digital cinema packages um, with the picture and the sound all in one package, the projectors and everything. So they're, I mean, they're not the only ones trying to do this, but certainly that's their, that's their new goal really is to become a, a, a one-stop shop for um, digital cinema. So, sad news, Ray Dolby uh, passed away last Friday at the age of 80, and he, he will be missed. Um, he's he's definitely uh, someone who has changed everybody that listens to this podcast's lives in one way or another, whether you know it or not. Um, so let's move on, let's go to hardware news, and Steve, you finally got um, a Panasonic projector through, which we've been waiting on for Seems like over a year now since we yeah we have been waiting we for initially, <laughs> initially saw it at Pinewood, but uh, they've finally given you it. It's an LED laser hybrid. What do you think? Well, yeah, you're right, Phil. Uh, it's been nearly a year trying to get hold of this for various reasons. It was delayed, um, and we finally got it in. For those perhaps who don't don't know exactly what an LED laser hybrid projector is, um, it's as the name might suggest, is a combination of LEDs and a laser. So there's a red a red LED and a blue LED, and then there's a blue laser which is bounced off of, of, of a fluorescent disc, which creates the green for the image. 
Um, the idea behind it predominantly is that it makes it much, much brighter. I mean, this projector is 3,000 lumens against the majority of LED-only projectors that I've seen, which are probably be about 1,000 lumens. So it's, it's significantly brighter. I mean, quite a lot brighter. Now, that's good, obviously. And the other major advantage, clearly, like LED themselves, is that um, you know, you've got the instant on and off. You've got the consistent... Um, performance it doesn't you know, it doesn't tend to decay or, or dim over over time the way that a bulb would and obviously you've got a much much longer life cycle so you're talking like 10 20 thousand hours so you know that's more like uh you know basically t- you know, it could be 10 years of, of um of average use so it's it, it's it's obviously the, the reason this project is developed is by panasonic professional for the professional market so it's places where they maybe just leave them on all day perhaps displays in museums that kind of stuff so it's not exactly a a home cinema consumer projector having said that you know it, it it is perfectly capable of that i got it home set it up um it's got one of those annoying little um little controls on the front fill like i think like the other the panasonic domestic projectors where you move the uh lens shift up and down and across and then lock oh, it that in horrible little joystick yep horrible little <laughs> joystick it's got that it's not exactly a looker but then it's not designed to be it's meant for the professional market um it's got an awful lot of professional related features on there but within it it has a rec 709 setting and a cinema setting it's got a white balance control so you can set the grayscale i set it up um interestingly the i we reviewed a, or i reviewed a, an acer led laser hybrid projector about this time last year in fact and one thing i noticed on that was that there was an awful lot of green in the image which kind of makes sense since there's a massive well green uh blue laser creating a massive green element to the picture and that was very skewed towards uh, green and it was also slightly towards uh, yellow, actually. And uh, on the uh, Panasonic, the measurements I've taken so far have actually been very similar to that. So I, I think uh, from a perspective of, a, sort of a, a very accurate home cinema projector, the big problem they've got is reining in the colours a bit because they are quite, um, qu- quite saturated, uh, particularly in terms of luminance. Uh, having said that, Watching films on it, they look really good. I mean, you know, it's, it's a DLP projector, but because it's using LED laser, they, you know, there's no rainbows. It's got the sort of lovely motion handling of an LED, of a DLP projector. It's got uh, it's got a nice intraframe contrast ratio, although blacks themselves, native blacks, aren't as impressive as some of the other manufacturers. Uh, it's very bright, um, and and you know, it produces a, a really nice image. Um, it's three thousand six hundred, so you know, it's not overly expensive. Uh, it's probably you know, that's that's basically budgetish projector market, well, mid 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 market, say, uh, equivalent to a little bit more expensive, perhaps, than the JVC X35 or the Sony um, HW50. But, uh, you know, certainly it's not a ridiculous money, and you are getting clear advantages. You know, obviously, you're not having to use a bulb. Um, so, I mean, I'm still in the middle of, of reviewing it, but I've got to say, so far, I, I could live with it. You know, I think, well, you know, that's uh, that would be an interesting alternative. Obviously, the, 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 the holy grail, the dream, <laughs> is... 4K panel, LED laser hybrid uh, light source, and uh, you know, and a, a very effective CMS, so you can get the colours accurate. That would be the ideal combination, in my opinion. And used for about thirty grand. Well, probably. Yeah. <laughs> you see that data set has ruined him. He's yeah. got he's got lottery winner taste now. He's, yeah. He's, <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. No it's all cham- man, champagne and caviar now around my place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So you mentioned 4K. Another bit of news uh, which came out this week. Uh, thanks to CDR Info website, uh, was that uh, one of the manufacturers of replication machines accidentally put a press release out promoting their new disc replicating machine, which is designed for the new 4K Blu-ray discs, which will be 100 gig. No, uh, no massive surprise there. I think we'd all kind of assumed that 100 gigs was what they were aiming for. I think what was slight, not massive surprise, but again was unusual, is that everyone thought it was going to be four layer, 25 gig a layer, but this apparently is a three layer at 33. Giga layer, but yeah, 100 gigabyte um, HEVC codec. Um, that that I mean, everyone, it's coming. 4K Blu-ray is coming. It's just a question of when. Hopefully, this time next year. Can I ask a very foolish question at this point, uh, as an idiot? Um, I'm sure that somebody else listening to this podcast will be glad I ask it, even if it's only one of them. 100 gigs. Where does that sit in terms of, you know, headroom for a typical? hollywood blockbuster in 4k does that give you the space to get it on with extras well and the, proper soundtrack or the, would you still be two disking it well we can only go from the press release so far because there has been no technical announcement from the bda the blu-ray disc association yet on how it's going to work 
um, whether it's going to be backwards compatible or you need to go and buy a new Blu-ray uh, player to read the three the three layers of the disc. We don't know that at the minute. Uh, in terms of getting it all on there, we have to presume at this moment in time that that's due to the codec um, and compression is going to be used on that, um, which will be HEV, HEVC. Oh, I hate saying that. <laughs> um, H.265. <laughs> yeah, H.265. Uh, that's easier to say. Um, they, they reckon, or certainly reading between the lines, that, that that's going to be the compression that's used, that it's capable of uh, of fitting all that data from a 4K and compressing it well enough. And I've got to say, MPEG-4, when you look at that compared to MPEG-2, I mean, the, the differences... I mean, I hear a lot of people going on about bit rates and all the rest of it. Well, actually... You can have a bit rate of about six or seven in, with an HD uh, video or whatever, and it looks fantastic. You can't see compression on it. So um, if they can get that down low bit rates or low enough bit rates so you know you can't see the uh, the degradation or you can't see any gradation in the image or uh, blocking and so on. And when I was at Pan Panasonic Hollywood Labs, um, they did a demo with the uh, actual master, of a movie and the compressed Blu-ray HD uh, version on the same screen, side by side. So it was the same same frame, um, but like with a line down the middle and one side was one. And we had to guess, and it was really difficult to pick out the master. And that was on and that was on a thirty foot screen, and that was at ten eighty p res uh, master on both sides. It was just one's compressed and one one wasn't compressed. Yeah. Um, and it really was quite difficult. You had to get quite close up to the screen before you, you could actually notice the difference. So that was impressive. So if the compression on H.265 is is as good as they say it is, and I've yet to see a proper side-by-side -side with that, um, they could fit on a 100-gig disc, uh, Ed. As for extras and so on, I don't know. Well, unfortunately, um, extras seem to be taking a bit of a nosedive recently I, I don't know if you've seen but there's been an uproar about star trek into darkness because what paramount have done is that they've actually released extras with certain retail exclusive um retailer exclusive discs so not all the extras are on the actual you know mass market consumer available disc some of them are you know exclusive to certain retailers the commentary track was only available on itunes if you bought it through apple uh, and that's a, a worrying trend because you know as AV fans and film fans, we you want to buy the Blu-ray because it's the best picture and sound quality available. But you also want all the extras that come with it. You know that's what you're paying for. It's a premium product, um, and, and it seems that you know manufacturers are starting to, oh sorry, not manufacturers, studios are starting to, some of them at least, pushing people towards um, downloading uh, as an alternative. And and uh, as a disc-based fan, that worries me. I have to say, I, I've never been big on extras. I know that's a sort of faintly heretical comment to make, but uh, no, it's not been not been a big part of my existence. I have to genuinely adore the film before I have any interest in watching anything other than the film. Start stoking the fires, burn them. <laughs> I'm miles away from you. You'll I can have to see get up. Burning You're flames outside that door. <laughs> hours away from me. I've got plenty of time to, to fortify my house. I've got to say, uh, go on, Mark. I was just going to say, it, it seems like quite a smart way of doing it if you want to keep down manufacturing costs and the like. If you consider the amount of uh, Blu-rays that come out with two discs where people only ever tend to put in the film disc. That'd people don't... Nice. Yeah, exactly. People and, and they're pressing two discs. They're putting it out there. If it came with you know one disc and you get the code there, you can download what you want with regards to the extras, that kind of thing. Because, I mean, there are some discs out there that put in kind of like about four or five commentary tracks and you're getting down to like, you know, the grip or something, you know, it, it really is. They're scraping the barrel and some of them. Mark, I wouldn't mind that so much if they used, if they did that and then used the extra space um, to spend a bit more time on the compression and making sure that, uh, you know, they were getting the, the absolute best out of it. But you just have to see some, just look at some encode jobs that some uh, manufacturers studios put out there um and they're pretty bloody awful when you consider is, how much space they've actually got yeah i mean this is always the worry isn't it as soon as you start talking about cost cutting measures you hope that should we say the profit margins will go will get put to the right places but it that doesn't always work does it 
Yeah, that's very true. It, and at the end of the day, they're, they're looking to make money. I mean, there was a, an interesting argument on the forums, you know, when you're talking about going to 4K versus 1080, and there's a lot of things that they could do um, to improve HD quality. But at the same token, there was things that they could do to, they could have done to improve SD um, when SD was, well, some will argue it's still the, the major way of watching things if you're watching TV and so on. Um, you know, I've used broadcast cameras for doing our videos on the forums, um, and the the one that Steve now has it it had an SD uh, SD capability as well as being a full HD camera, um, and you watch the stuff, the standard definition stuff that came out off of that camera, on the tape, uh, and playing it back, and then you you suddenly realise how good standard definition could look. You know how crisp it was, how sharp it was, um, and and just how good it looked. And then you compared it to, uh, you know, the kind of standard definition that we used to from broadcasters and so on. And and it's night and day. Um, and of course, it's the same thing when you're looking at 1080. You know, if it's 1080 that you've captured, um, and even compress yourself and then compare it to some uh, Blu-ray discs, and you think, well, you know. How, how have they done that? How have they mucked it up so much? Well, Sky um, are the worst offenders when it comes to some of their HD broadcasts. Yeah, well, I got rid of Sky Movies because of that. Uh, because you could you could see compression issues. Uh, any dark scenes, any scenes with uh, mist or, or anything like that, you got loads of band and deg- uh, gradation issues. Uh, you had the whole, the whole gamut in there. Um, so I got rid of Sky Movies because of that. It's all right for extreme mm. couponing, though, I've found. You lost me. You're, yeah, not, me too. You, you're, not, you're not familiar with that. If you haven't watched Extreme Couponing, then I'm sorry, you aren't making full use of your satellite subscriptions. I'd, I'd need to say no more than that. It's, it's, I don't get Swedish channels, Ed. It's not. Is that, it's, is that the it's, one in the States where they get the coupons and for magazines and stuff and papers and they. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Honest to God, I'd nev- I've never seen anything like it, and, and hopefully I never will for real, but it's 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 unbelievable. I mean, quite how none of these people have scurvy is, um, is, uh, is something, given that they basically live on hot sauce and noodles, because those are the things they can buy in the largest vouchered quantities. But no, it, it's extraordinary. Uh, it, even if you only watch one episode, just record an episode and, and, and savour it as and when you, you, you've got 26 minutes to be... Uh, horrified and fascinated in equal measure it's fabulous and it is in hd ish whilst we're plugging tv shows then (laughs) 27th of september channel four uh they start broadcasting um agents of shield which is the spin-off tv series from the marvel movies uh pilots written directed by um joss whedon um which stars some of the people from the films um greg greg clark is playing agent coulson in it colby smolders is playing agent hill and um i think he's show running it too so it's actually got an excellent pedigree, and uh, I have high hopes for it, as long as the budget's there for some decent effects. should be a good show. And it's on Channel 4 and not bloody Sky, so excellent. <laughs> Sky will buy it if it gets successful. Yeah, well, know, they, they, they always do, do keep that. keep doing that on the shows yeah. I watch on Channel 4. Don't, don't <coughs> why do you think they don't bother put- <laughs> yeah, why do you think they don't bother putting in the highest bid for the first season? Same with Lost, the same with 24. You let yeah, everyone... Yeah. Yeah, you let everyone who, the little plebs just using their free, free view, <laughs> and you let them all get addicted to it, and then you blow BBC or Channel 4 or whoever completely out of the water. That's right, I just yeah. wait for it to come up on Netflix. And... <laughs> so I watched Glee after it went to Sky. I would rather stick a knitting needle through my eye than give Murdoch a penny of my money. I'd rather stick a knitting needle through my eye than watch Glee. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, Glee's great. Shut it's up. It's sad that Corey Monteith top, popped his clogs. But, I would know. honestly rather eat my own scrotum than watch another minute. It's absolutely <laughs> dreadful. I'd pay to watch you eat your own scrotum. Well, I know you would, but I'm, I'd be well, selling out to, to Sky Glee. if I did that. Sorry. Now, that would be quality television. No, no, guys, come on. We're only we're only 20-odd minutes into the podcast here. Let's let's not go down that road just yet. <laughs> we'll save that for later, Zoe. Yeah, let's not go off on a tangent just yet. <laughs> Damn fine television, in my opinion. <laughs> Glee. That would actually get me to Sky if that was on TV. What, me eating my own scrotum or Glee? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, right, well, as I say, I, I'll need to, need, to, need to negotiate a decent price. What you could but... do is just set out a coupon for your scrotum and then other people... <laughs> <laughs> Crossover. <laughs> Crossover television is the future. We know that. Let me just write this down. Dear Rupert Murdoch, 
<laughs> billionaire tyrant. It'd be like uh, Alan, Par- <laughs> Alan Partridge. Idea for show. <laughs> <laughs> we could get in guest stars. Ed Balls could be in it. Right, enough. So, moving on to uh, movie news, and before we go to Steve to find out um, what he's been sitting, uh, watching at the cinema, we should quickly discuss the Star Wars spin-off movies and also the Millennium Falcon Returns to Episode 7. That was always going to happen, wasn't it? I'd have been, yeah, I'd have been amazed if they hadn't put it in. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, okay, move on. We know that. <laughs> we kind of guessed that, looking at who's coming back. But it in is these. nice knowing they are actually building it right now. It's kind of like, oh, it's actually happening. It's real. It's not just, I didn't just dream this or imagine it. They are making a seven Star Wars film. They have got the, you know, the original actors on board. J.J. Abrams is going to direct it. And, uh, and the Millennium Falcon will be in it. So, colour me happy right now. Yeah, but after after 1999, I just don't want to get my hopes up. You know, it's just well, look, Phil, it can't be worse. Can well, it? I mean, that would be impossible. Those <laughs> are those are words you may live to regret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, interesting as well. And again, not any major news is is that JJ said no more Star Trek. So um, we kind of guessed that that was probably going to happen as well it's hard for them to do both yeah it? almost impossible so it'll be interesting to see who takes that on and moves it forward um because he did get quite a bit of flack um within the darkness well he yeah. blamed the gaming community in a little way you see he was oh, very man. much why well he said that the the star trek game that came out he thinks it kind of negatively affected people's perception of Into Darkness because it came out around the same time as the movie came out. And it was, uh, frankly, a bit of a buggy mess, to be honest. Um, and he seems to have taken that quite to heart. I think that's ridiculous. I've never even heard of the Star Trek game, you know. So I think that's clutching at straws, if you want. I, mean, I actually watched Star Trek Into Darkness last week on Blu-ray. I did see it at the cinema. And I have to say, I enjoyed it sec- second time around more because I didn't have the weight of expectation and I kind of knew what to expect and just went for the ride. It was great. Um, I was much the same. Um, did you see the R2-D2 in it? No, what was that? There is an R2-D2, R2-D2 in Into Darkness. At the point where, I, I don't know, in saying this, there has to be spoilers. Is that all right? Figures of authority? Um, is it okay? Yeah, if if anybody doesn't want a spoiler, uh, go and mute for the next 12 Minute. seconds. On you go. <laughs> right. When the Enterprise is attacked in warp, um, it blows a big hole out. People are sucked out into space. And if you look very closely, one of the things being sucked out into space is an R2-D2. Just check Excellent. it. It's there. And they, you'll see it. That was 12 seconds on the dot. What can I say? I can Ed's, a, prof- Ed's a professional. <laughs> <laughs> So the only thing worrying me is these Star Wars spin-off movies. Do, do we want uh, an origin story of Jar Jar Binks? You can have too much of a good thing, can't you? I, you really can. I, let's face it, I think they'll choose... You, you, there are a number of people whom I, I, I would Fett. love to know more about where how they came to be. Boba Fett, Jango Fett, Boba Fett. They have to be... No. Yeah, they no have I think to he's be. already buggered no. that up with the prequels. I mean, Boba Fett was cool. Now it's just... It's all... A See, mess, isn't it? the question is, is there a decent origin story? Tarkin. I'd love to know how he came to <laughs> no, be no, no. absolutely I mean, like that. As in, in films, has there ever been an iconic character that you could say you, they went back and made a decent origin story? I'm thinking um, Wolverine, fairly terrible. Nah. I'm thinking um, Hannibal, shouldn't have even gone there. Hmm. Um, I'm struggling to think of any character where I can say I love them in a particular film and I actually wanted to go and see that Origins movie because each one just seems to be a massive disappointment waiting to happen. Yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've got to agree um, with Mark on that one. I, I, do, I do think that origin stories are a bit of a, a dead end uh, narratively. I would rather they just did standalone films within the Star Wars universe. Because, uh, if, you know, if you look at the Clone Wars TV show, I, I actually quite enjoyed that. I thought it was good fun. Uh, you know, lots of nice little ideas in there, done by a very creative team. And, and so there is potential for good stuff to be done within the Star Wars universe. But if doing an origin story of Boba Fett or, or Yoda or something like that just just feels like like anything. You know where it's going to end up. I, yeah, want, I, mean the, I want the origin story of how they managed to get Leah into that gold bikini. Carefully, behind I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Bulimia. 
Whereas, um, no, I was just thinking they could they could just subvert expectations. They could do the backstory of the first stormtrooper through the door of the ship in episode four, who then immediately gets shot in the head. But it just ends. Like a, it ends at that exact moment. Be like the kind of Perfect. backstory in, in Austin Powers. Yeah. The security yeah. guard. <laughs> You know, all the people he left behind. It was a routine mission and he got slotted in the head. Just or or all, the, all the joiners and plumbers that were working on the Death Star when it got blown <laughs> up. They knew the risks when they took the job. <laughs> they were part of a union. <laughs> Their choice. They were part of a guild, obviously, because that is established in a Souls universe that there are guilds. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to, and I'd a lot of taxation, to apparently. A, I'd love to see a union rep negotiating with the Emperor. <laughs> I, I somehow think that that would be one side. In, in Family Guy, when they're talking about Stewie's Darth Vader is going, so the, the, the Death Star is impenetrable. Yes, sir. Absolutely. 99.9%. Wouldn't we do my job if I didn't ask this, but what's the 0.001%? Uh, there's this one little exhaust port that leads right to the central core. That's more than a tiny <laughs> problem, isn't it? Maybe we can cover it up with something. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, get some quotes. Yeah, okay. Joking aside, origin stories. The one I would love to see, mainly because he is my favourite character in the entire Star Wars universe, would be Wedge. I think that'd be awesome. I'm assuming that Dennis Lawson isn't on board for the the reboot, but you know. And they can't cast his his nephew um, because he's already been in the films. <laughs> Absolutely. But um, no, as I say, I think that'd be great. You know, why on earth is he called Wedge? For starters, would be um, you know a question worth asking. I think the clue is in the film when he's Wedge pull out. You can't do any more good back there. I think we know what was going on, and it wasn't a dog fight. <laughs> only, only for you, Steve. You know, <laughs> but uh, all right, point taken. So I mean, if the if the cast Dwayne Johnson in this, oh my God, I trousers <laughs> exploded. They put down the rock into Star Wars, and the set, barely, the set in Hong you know, Kong. <laughs> I can barely get over the excitement of Fast and Furious 7. Tony Jaa has just joined that cast. I mean, that how good is this film going to be? Possibly the best film of all time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, well, well, if Channing been... Tatham joined the film, that would be it. That would be, I just would die a happy man. Uh, while we've been discussing that, I have been racking my brains, thinking of all the different characters in the Star Wars universe, and going back to what Mark originally said, I can't think of one that would make a good origin story. I'm really racking my brain here, and, and you know, the the idea of the stormtrooper that makes more sense to me <laughs> than any of these characters and their origins. Who wants to know about Yoda? We know everything we need to know, and that was one of the suggestions. Han Solo, mm, not really. See, you've either got characters who are completely kind of one-dimensional. Like, I mean, Yoda for, is just basically one note. He's this kind of weird little Zen being. That that's all he ever seems like he ever was or you've got kind of more like the rogues like Han Solo and the reason why they're called is because you meet them in that state you kind of don't want to see how Han Solo became the kind of wise cracking guy Yep. You don't want to see him, you know, go through like, you know, his first breakup or something, you know, buying his troublesome his first waistcoat. Team. You know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, do these trousers look all right? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, totally. And, and, and of course, anyway, you're Yoda, Yoda, Yoda sell you. 800 years old. And I mean, isn't yeah. that going to be, isn't that going to require his own trilogy to do a backstory that would be for 800 a, years? Peter Jackson, three films. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 12 hours of war. <laughs> Subcontract it out. <laughs> Eight yeah. hours in, he's barely been born. Yeah, but he's already selling you a Vodafone phone contract. <laughs> Brilliant. No, the problem with things like that, and you're right, guys, is that you know if you did a backstory for Han Solo, that diminishes his first appearance in Star Wars. You know, if you show the Millennium Falcon prior to its appearance in Star Wars, actually they've already buggered that. Can't think about it because the first time you see it in the film proper is when Luke goes, "What a piece of junk!" But in the special edition, you've seen it earlier with the Jabba the Hut sequence. That's totally buggering up the reveal of the Millennium Falcon. Lucas, I oh, don't get me started. I'm going to start getting angry again. Sorry. <laughs> I, mean, I need to have a cup of tea and calm down. Yeah, well, you see, the the thing that bothers me is, you know, when when they announced the prequels, you know, it, we'd had um, so much time between, you know, over a decade with no Star Wars, and they said we're gonna we're gonna go back and look at the Clone Wars, and the excitement level was there. It was like, yeah, this is, and the CGI that they've got now, oh, it's gonna be fantastic. And then we saw the special editions in '97, and it was like, okay. All right. Well, well, obviously they rushed it, and you know, let's let's give them some some leeway here, um, and then the disappointment. 
I had yeah, a letter Ator. published Ator. in Empire Magazine in 97 where I said, don't get excited about the prequels because I think they're going to be rubbish. I'm going to dig that out and read it out next time I'm on this podcast because I was the one that was the first to point out <laughs> oh, yes. it's going to be crap. Yes, of course you are. Yeah, I'll I bet it. you've still got it. Yep, it I have. Hong Kong stamps on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was living in Jersey then, actually, in Hong Kong. Okay, but, let's... Uh, yeah, I've still got it, and I'm going to dig it out. <laughs> let's quickly move on to another franchise uh, with a little bit of news. Bond 24, expanded role for Money Penny. Well, now that we know who Money Penny is, and we saw her in action... Um, is, is, is it going to turn into a buddy movie? <laughs> so the sound of this, Money Penny should be behind a desk flirting with Bond. That's it. End of the role. Um, very 21st century, Steve. Nice one. So that, it, it, there's a, there are certain you know, archetypes in these films and we should stick to them. I don't want it changed. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. M's a man again. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Money penny behind I the think, desk. I think I think you just after saying you wanted to see two, two blokes fight to the death last week, I think the sexism thing. Don't go there, Steve. Just just <laughs> leave it. Leave it alone. He watches Glee. That's enough balance to the other side. Yeah, exactly. I'm clearly comfortable with my sexuality. You guys yes, might not just be make that. everyone else uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, quite. Uh, I, I don't know. Sam Mendes did a great job with uh, Skyfall, so um, you know, I I, I feel that franchise is currently in very good hands it lives or dies. Well, they, they live or die on on the villain quite frankly i don't really care how, how much money penny is or isn't doing uh it lives or dies on the villain um and much as i quite liked skyfall i've said it said it when it came out and i'll say it again i don't believe that revenge is a great pretext for a bond vi- bond movie um so hopefully they won't do that again she that might she been. might be the villain she's already shot him once <laughs> that's a good point um but we'll see how it goes but yeah, yeah it's, that's um, right we, we need some more world domination someone with a gigantic plan to like turn everyone into fish or something it needs to be you know some megalomaniac <laughs> and he needs to, he dear, needs to have a cat dear mr murdoch <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> they've, they've already, they've they've already, already done, done that one yeah sorry <laughs> sorry they have, they've already done that one yeah, so. <laughs> bond goes to rescue glee for freeview <laughs> High stakes. It could be Bond takes on the Guardian, NSA, GCHQ. I don't know. There'd be some wish. As I say, there's some wish for film. The the, the Bourne Ultimatum already went. Which which Bourne was it? Where they slotted a Guardian journalist in Waterloo? Ultimatum. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's already done some wish fulfillment there. I very much of the opinion that Bond is one of those things that becomes almost cyclical. It's it's like it has to go into hibernation once every decade and then it'll emerge again you know kind of maybe 10 years later i think it's it's the kind of format that you know when they try to to in any way do anything inventive people scream and shout about it and people get a little bit upset and say no this shouldn't happen go back to the standard you know you want your big maniacal villain you want uh, you know a cloud base or something mad Uh, but people tend to you know three four five films by about the fourth film, people just tend to get a little bit... Uh, it's it's samey, you know? So I, I can totally see why they went down the revenge angle and why people almost now feel it, it'll be a breath of fresh air to go back to a bit more kind of political machinations and the like. Well, the thing is, with property prices what they are, hollowed out volcanoes are going to look like the smart choice anyway by the time this <laughs> one comes out. So, you know... <laughs> It's like, yeah, we did we did look at some prime London real estate, but we decided it was easier to just remove two billion tons of magma. Yeah, all right. Blofeld on grand designs. <laughs> oh, Doctor Evil meets Bond. He's going to make a Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, Parsons the Alan Parsons project. project. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see a Bond film where the villain just shoots him in the back of the head in the first five minutes. <laughs> None of this monologuing, just like, bang, right, next. <laughs> Send in 006. Or you could use it as a Pixar short in front of something else if you cut it down to five minutes, couldn't you? But, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, but you could go on a whole different t- tangent and kill Bond in the first five minutes, introduce a new character. And then Money Penny goes out for revenge, yes. All right, Steve's yeah. nailed it. Job done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd watch an hour and a half for her. <laughs> Yeah. Those being sexist. How will the other people in the cinema react to that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go Uncomfortably, there. I should imagine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to wrap up on the movies. Uh, so, Steve, what's at the cinema? Well, this week we had Insidious, 
Chapter 2, uh, which is, as the name might suggest, a sequel to a film called Insidious, which was actually quite a big hit uh, a couple of years ago, 2010, I think it was. Made about $100 million worldwide off a budget of $1.5 million. So with those kind of numbers, the sequel was pretty much inevitable. I've got to say, I actually saw it in a double bill. So it's Insidious and Insidious Chapter 2 at the City World near where I live, who were showing it as a double bill, which was bloody handy because I hadn't seen Insidious. And Insidious Chapter 2 takes off exactly where Insidious ends and it assumes you have a lot of knowledge of the first film. It's one of the few, 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 few hang on, say that again. It's one of the few sequels I've seen where you really, really have to know the first film. There are sequences in the second film that actually take place in the first film, if you know what I mean, but from a different perspective. Oh, so uh, it's like Back to the Future 2? In some respects, yes. And in fact, I kind of like that. I thought, oh, that's actually quite clever. I wonder if they thought of that like, when they made the first film, whether they just got lucky and realised there was a scene they could do this in in the second film. But it does assume a lot of knowledge from the first film. They're basically this kind of current trend of movies where you know, they're sort of ghost stories, lots of bangs, lots of shocks, lots of scares, not very much gore, um, more sort of old school horror, basically. Um, they, uh, these films are unbelievably derivative. Uh, basically, they, they should be sued by the makers of Poltergeist because it, it rips off massive chunks of that film. Um, but they also chuck in loads of others. The Shining is in there, Woman in Black's in there, you name it, it's in there. Um, but at times, they do do interesting things. There's some quite cool plot devices. There are a couple of interesting scenes, like I said. The one where they end up going back into the first film in a different perspective, I thought was actually genuinely quite cool. Having just seen the first one and thinking at the time what was going on here, then it all made sense in the second film. So if that was what their intention from the beginning, that was actually quite brave of them. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's got lots of scares. Uh, unfortunately, with anything where, where there's a lot of scares, there's a kind of tempo to them. So after a bit, you get used to it, and then you start to anticipate the scares, um, and then it becomes less scary. And also there's a lot of exposition towards the end, and as soon as you start to explain something, it becomes a lot less frightening, because what's scary is the unknown. Um, and once something's understandable and explained, it's okay. So I'd probably give them about 6 out of 10, uh, fun, you know, and scary in places, but hugely derivative. The other film I saw, though, uh, was White House Down, which is the new one from Roland Emmerich. And as you'd expect from Roland Emmerich, it is big, dumb, and loads of fun. I absolutely loved it. Uh, Chang Tatum, I actually am a big fan of. I think he's a really great leading man. He's got Jamie Fo- <laughs> Oh, he's, he's, he's fun. He's, he's, he's charming in his own way, and I like him. Um, he's got Jamie Foxx in it. Uh, it's basically Die Hard in the White House, and it unashamedly knows that from the beginning and makes no excuses for its behaviour, uh, and just and just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So not just machine guns and f- f- terrorists. You've got helicopters, you've got tanks, you've got Humvees, you've got the lot rocket launchers. The president with a rocket launcher outside of the massive, um, the beast, you know that huge car that they drive them around in. It's a lot better than certainly the last two Die Hard movies. Anyway, <laughs> at least, you know, at least it's entertaining, and thank God. Roland Emmerich knows how to shoot action scenes by keeping the bloody camera still and not having it shot by a cameraman with Parkinson's and an editor with ADD. You could actually tell what was going on. You weren't getting a headache or feeling motion sickness watching it. Uh, And it was just really well-staged action scenes in a good old school way that was a pleasure to watch. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, If you like action movies, if you like kind of big dumb stuff like that uh, you will not you will be hugely entertained um there are there are moments where you're grown i think oh god but actually it's it's genuinely really funny at times too there's a bit at the beginning where the guy to the white house is going this is the main part of the white house you know the bit that got blown up in independence day which is quite a nice little nod to his own film um and yeah it's very funny very hugely entertaining it's got a great cast got james woods in it um it's got maggie gillen hal in it it's you know it's it's a it's a it's a classic emmerich uh you know blockbuster uh, check your brain at the door, sit back, enjoy yourself, and you will enjoy it. I'll give that a solid 8 out of 10. Strong words. Mm. So that's women and people with Parkinson's <laughs> insulted. <laughs> and ADD as well. If you've got attention deficit, uh, attention deficit Yeah, but that one's them. made up. ADHD, yes. Yeah, yeah. Advanced ADHD. Dungeons and Dragons. What's the H for? Hyper. Hyperactivity. Hyperactivity. Hyper. Ah, it's not too much you Coca-Cola. Not You're normally yeah. smacking somebody else in the head at the same time. Yeah. Like a man who's just watched the Channing Tatum film. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's like being hit around the head with a giant boxing glove, but I like that sometimes. <laughs> not not <laughs> literally, but metaphorically. <laughs> yeah, but if it was The Rock providing it. Well, like I said, The Rock and Channing Tatum in the same film, and that's me, I'm done. Put them in a Star Wars prequel. <laughs> That is possibly the only thing that could save a Star Wars prequel, I think. Giant men with miniature lightsabers. 
<laughs> as opposed to miniature Yodas with miniature lightsabers, which was bloody awful. <laughs> I think you meant something else, Steve. Yeah, I know, but I don't want to go there. So we're not going to go there. We're going to go to tech news, which is next. I'm getting really good at these. Yeah. Okay, uh, tech-wise, Apple had the big announcement last Tuesday. We were expecting a cheap iPhone, and it turned out to be not so cheap, uh, which was the 5C, which everybody knew about. If you, if you read the internet for the last few months, you already knew what was going to be announced. Uh, the interesting phone, slightly interesting phone, was the 5S, which is a top-of-the-line uh, model, with the fingerprint reader that everybody's been making jokes about. Um, I'm now sick of looking at my Facebook feed because it's just full of um, the same memes over and over and over. Uh, but what did we think, guys? I mean, personally, I've got an iPhone 4, and I shall be staying with the iPhone 4. Well, I was going to say the same thing, except that I swear every time a new piece of iPhone hardware is announced, the existing models get slower and slower and slower and slower, and I'm sure that it's not a coincidence. Um, I don't know. It's inter- I mean, I think, obviously, the, the, the standalone price for the 5C, presumably the... <laughs> it's all about the contracts that it's sold with that's going yeah. to get the price down to, to sensible levels. I do think, I mean, because it's very hard to judge these things, but I think the colours that the 5C come in, and actually the, 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 there's no, other than other than the dubious fingerprint scanner app, there's not a huge amount to call between the two of them. I do think that actually the 5C is going to cannibalise sales of the 5S um, quite considerably, because if one of those colours becomes you know, zeitgeisty, for want of a better word, um, I, I think that could actually be that, that, that you know, people just go, well, I don't want a gold iPhone, I want one in, you know, snot green or whatever one of those colours is, and that's going to be, that that could be the issue, and it, I, I guess it will also come down to the contracts that are available with it, but um, am I definitely going to go and buy one? No. Um, I am going to have to buy a new phone this year, I suspect, but uh, whether it Apple get my money, or whether one of the Android ones get the, that gets the money is is to be decided. Mark, Android. <laughs> Sorry. So what? <laughs> just, 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 just Android. Android. We heard. Android. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That's the sum total of my repost. Well, you see, they made a big thing with the five S. It's got the new A seven processor. It's got an M seven motion processor. Uh, there were touting the gaming side of things mark it, it's now 64 bit i really didn't see the point of it to be honest and the gaming side i mean is it a big market mark i say it's a massive market you know mobile gaming is huge um but you you have seen android slowly kind of bite into apple's share of, of this idea that you know, that's the only place you can go for reasonable apps and reasonable games and the like. And I do think, you know, over the next 10 years, you will see more the anything that is open start to pretty much dominate. I, I can't see any way forward. I, I think the, the days of, of closed operating systems are starting to dwindle. I think Apple's whole kind of ecosystem, I think they're they're fairly soon hitting a crossroads where they'll have to decide which way they want to go, whether they do try and, you know, go and innovate in a, in a different field or whether they just accept that from here on out it's price cuts, similar technology and hope to stave off whatever's coming from Android. Ed's point about it, them, the older devices getting slower uh, is genuinely true. I've noticed that as well and I guess oh, we'll find out Alleg- today when allegedly, the podcast goes. Allegedly. Well, it's true. Well, it's Same as Windows. Has been, they do get a bit slower. Um, but today, obviously, as this podcast goes out, iOS 7 will be launched so we can all find out for ourselves. Well, I never I never go anywhere near them for, for a month and a half. Um, you know, I'll let everyone else find what's wrong with it first. I've seen, um, I've seen it um, on a being beta tested by another journalist on one on an iPhone uh, five out of five, and um, it did look quite cool. Does my will my iPhone four even do that, or yes. is it? <laughs> yes, no, it will explode. <laughs> it, well. Allegedly, um, it'll work from iPad. It's iPad two up and iPhone four up. 
I I do remember with the iPhone 3G when it was when it changed to what was the first one where you could do folders was it iOS 4 or iOS 5 and putting either of those onto the iPhone 3G basically it was like running a 90s PC game on a on a on an inadequate machine with all the detail levels set to maximum everything moved with that same decidedly unslick <laughs> and slightly slightly uh, slightly sort of desperate me- sort of movement so i'm, I'm concerned that um, i'll i'll see what the feedback is on the on ios mm-hmm. 7 on the iphone 4 before i go anywhere near it and apple let rest on their laurels here are well the, i mean they, how do you reinvent uh, i mean jo- joking aside i mean obviously if we all knew how to reinvent the mobile phone again i dare say we'd be employed by cupertino or one of the main rivals but half the problem is that i don't think there's that much third-party game-changing technology on which to call and we're at a bit of a plateau at the moment because as it stands the vast majority of the inside of these devices is battery and you've got to be careful what pro- what you promise uh, to, to do it i mean i dare say you could probably run some sort of crude holographic projection of a phone sized device but you'd have a battery life measured in minutes when you did it so what's the point uh, the, you know we've got to be we've got to wait until other parts of of the whole industrial process have caught up but you've also got things like data consumption and the like to think about and tariffs i mean ultimately they are still tethered to how much you pay for them and so therefore you know what you should get out of them <laughs> You've got things like user-created content and the like that you could start bringing into play rather than this kind of closed system. Uh, there's, there is a lot out there. There's, there's a lot that they could do. But simply, it's, it's a question about what people are willing to pay for. People are happy paying, you know, one ninety nine for an app, putting it on their phone and then going out with it and being able to know that, that works and they're not going to use any extra data necessarily for that, you know. As, as soon as you start bringing in to the fact that, shall we say, we pay through the nose for our phone contracts in this country, then I, I just wonder how far you can go. I mean, it is a, it's a global market. It's not something you can simply look at. I'm going to challenge you on that one because I don't think uh, our market is all that bad. Uh, when no, it comes I, to must be Apple said, if you contract, look at what, what contract, some of other countries are suffering from. Just look at, just look at the States. You, you cannot buy a phone SIM free and you can't get a deal for a SIM card, just you just can't do it. They won't let you do it. T-Mobile are trying to change it over there, but um, obviously the rest of the marketplace just doesn't want to go there because what they're doing is they're tying people in for 24 months on a contract on a phone. Um, and I looked at some of the maths, and some of the some of these contracts like five five thousand, six thousand dollars a year that people are tied into. Um, whereas we have quite a bit of freedom thanks to the EU. And it's the only time I'm ever going to say that, <laughs> I think. Um, but thanks to the EU, we actually have quite a competitive market um, where you have quite a bit of choice. Um, I had the choice when I bought the iPhone 4 to buy it outright, unlocked, and then get a contract uh, SIM card, which cost me £400 less than what I would have done with a free phone over 24 months. So the cho- we've got the choice to do that. Whereas other countries, nah, you're tied in for two years. You ain't moving. You ain't getting an upgrade, and you're paying through the nose for it. Yeah, I'd I don't agree understand with why they don't let you upgrade on a contract because you're still going to obviously renew with them for another twenty-four month period. So they're still keeping your business. It always seems strange that they don't let you do that. This is the first step that T-Mobile are trying to introduce in the states. They're trying to give a little bit of freedom, and of course, all the other providers, because T-Mobile are tiny in the states, all the others. Um, are ganging up on them at the minute, and you know, trying to trying to make it look like their figures are false and all that. You know what the sta- what's like in the states. Once you know, they haven't got the same advertising rules that we have in this country yeah, as well. So, so they're really getting stuck in about them at the minute. And um, like I say, I mean, I, I looked at an article about this stuff, and I couldn't believe how much people have to pay for their contracts over there. We've got it quite lucky. Well, we've got a choice basically. They don't. Well, I'm stuck in for another year, but once it expires, I guess I'll probably get an iPhone six. Well, I'm both on rolling. I'm on a rolling month by month contract now for both iPhone and iPad. Um, but obviously, I'm, I'm saving up to have my foot fixed now, so it's not gonna <laughs> between your foot and the pram and the baby, you're bugging. Aren't yeah, you? that's it. No, 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 no more discretionary spending for me. Going to be perpetually strapped. 
Yeah, but I mean that in a broke way and not in the way that you <laughs> clearly mean it. <laughs> Put away that belt, Mr. Tatum. So to wrap up on the podcast, uh, let's get our games news. If you haven't listened to the games podcast for the 14th of this month, then go and download it after you finish listening to this podcast. Um, lots of interesting stuff in there, Mark. Um, and it was a bit of an extended edition this month. Yes, very much so. And we managed to talk almost solely about games, which was made for a nice change. And the contents of Ben's drawers. Yes, yes. And that. Jaws as in Chester Jaws or trousers. Yeah. You'll have to listen to the podcast to find out, Steve. <laughs> Get your interest, though, have Getting, <laughs> getting Steve to listen to a games tat. podcast. Um, he, uh, he, he responded with, you know, with some determination that he doesn't just buy random It was It was cleverly edited as well. I, that was, I thought that was quite funny, um, the way it was edited. There. So if you haven't listened to it yet, go download it. Listen to it after you finish here. Uh, so, Mark... Uh, moving on from what you discussed uh, last week, Grand Theft Auto Five, take it away. Yeah, well, um, I mean, by the time people listen to this, they should have their copies in their hands, but some people have been having a few problems with uh, Sony's preloads, whereby uh, Sony Europe have been trying to do a bit like with Steam, um, which is a, is a system that's never, well, didn't work that great to begin with, but it now seems to be buttery smooth, whereby... You pre-order a game, it downloads in the background, but then you're not allowed to play it until release day, obviously. So, you know, 1201 clicks over and then it's unlocked for you. Um, The only problem with this was there was a kind of minor mistake made whereby people were able to download it. Um, It was the end of August and it's, it's, I think it comes in about 18 gigabytes. Obviously, they couldn't play it, but some people kind of delved through files and the like and gave you a little bit of spoilerage with regards, kind of very minor tidbits like track lists for in the game. Um, and so this obviously got a few people annoyed to start with. And then when they found out that um, preload was set to begin on September the 13th was when it should have happened, uh, then that was delayed to the 16th. And there was a suitably a little bit of outrage because that gives most people on fairly poor, poor broadband deals you know they're not going to be able to download it in time because the the network's going to get absolutely hit, and probably is being so as we record this. Um, so they they then kind of pushed it a little bit closer. So it, it was set to be on the fifteenth, and then there were kind of minor delays and venting of spleens and lots of talk of people taking their balls and going home. Um, about forty minutes later, it began, but it has brought about a few kind of failed installs and the like, and. It's one of those little lessons which tells you that perhaps the network's set up for these things. Everyone decides that we want an all-digital future, but we're just not really that ready for it. The irony is if you'd ordered it on Amazon, you'd already have it. (laughs) Exactly. Well, Rockstar was supposed to have said to retailers not to ship it before, I think they said before the 16th, but, you know, Amazon being Amazon, I I doubt they were too bothered. (laughs) No, but it does kind of lead in quite nicely to the fact that Gabe Newell of Valve has been talking at LinuxCon in New Orleans about, um, well, basically about the the joys of kind of open OS and the like. Um, and he's kind of said that there should be some kind of news about um, how they're going to take things forward for Linux and gaming, uh, the quote about... Um, how we get there and what are the hardware opportunities we see for bringing Linux into the living room. A lot of people have kind of taken this to mean that he's going to be announcing something in the next week about the Steam box. And, you know, that could have major ramifications for the next gen consoles launching. Um, You know, if if he was going to bring that out with, say, something like Half-Life 3 as an exclusive, then that would absolutely fly off the shelves. Um, But, this being Valve, it could end up being nothing. So, you know, it's it's semi-news. It's quasi-news. It says Dr. Evil in the corner. Yes. Quasi-evil. <laughs> oh, my copy of Fast and Furious 6 arrived today. So, Hooray. this week, I intend to crank it up <laughs> and gorge myself on 
Vin Diesel and The Rock. <laughs> We were wearing the boxes on his feet like Howard Hughes. Okay, well, uh, sadly or gladly, that is the end of the podcast for yet another week. Uh, my thanks to Mark Botwright. Well, at least we've got a two-speed hedge cutter. Ed Selly. Look how he spends his time. 43 species of parrots, nipples for men. And Steve Weathers. How was I supposed to know we were going to hit an iceberg? It didn't say get off before the iceberg on the ticket. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Twitter is at AV Forums. Facebook, facebook.com forward slash AV forums you can also bookmark avforums.com for the latest news reviews and videos and why not leave us a rating on iTunes if you enjoyed the show thanks very much for listening I'm Phil Hinton and we'll see you again next Wednesday Wednesday